The science behind James Webb images. Space Launch System and Starship getting closer to their first flights. Remote surgery on the International Space Station. Perseverance finds more weird stuff on Mars. And Hubble is still going strong. All this and more in this week's episode of Space Bites. Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. And this is our Space Bites, where we talk about interesting space and astronomy news that happened this week. Now, this is a shorter version of my much longer weekly email newsletter. So if you want more space and astronomy news, you'll definitely want to sign up. But if you want a video version, here you go. Let's get into the news. The science behind James Webb images. Now we've been sharing pretty pictures from the James Webb Space Telescope for several weeks now, and it has been a constant crowd pleaser. But a lot of people ask very technical questions about those images. Which filters did they use? How long were the exposure times? What was the scientific information behind those pictures? And when we got that first group of images, we didn't get any of that background technical information. But Scientists behind the images have released a 15 page scientific document that explains in great detail exactly what went into it. What was the scientific basis for each of the images? What were they trying to discover? What kinds of filters did they use on James Webb? Which wavelengths? How long did they do their exposures for? And how did they integrate that data together? And what scientific conclusions can be reached? So if you want more information, really get behind the scenes and really better understand how this telescope works, we've got all the information for you. And there's been a lot of other science information coming out from James Webb. We've heard that the record for the farthest galaxy just keeps getting broken. And now it seems to be around Z equals 20, or about 180 million years after the Big Bang. We're also finding that galaxies are a lot more mature and fully evolved than astronomers were ever expecting. Although, I don't know, I feel like we say this all the time that the early universe seems to be more evolved, the galaxies were more formed than anyone was expecting. But now of course, James Webb can actually take pictures of these galaxies coming together. So hopefully, we'll get a final answer on how this all works. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, SpaceX tried to test their super heavy booster tried to test the Raptor 2 engine, and they had an explosion. And Elon Musk originally said it wasn't a big deal. And then later on said, Okay, maybe it is a big deal. And they had to take that booster back into the assembly building for maintenance. We learned that there was excess fuel in the area and that had exploded and caused some minor damage to the underside of the rocket, which is being repaired. Well, SpaceX did a test a static fire test with one of the Raptor two engines on the bottom of the super heavy. Everything seemed to go according to plan. So like this is just one Raptor engine, the fully configured super heavy is going to have 33 of these. So just imagine how powerful that's going to be when it actually launches. Musk said they're going to fire it again. And hopefully this time everything will go as planned. They're probably going to be installing some hardware that will allow it to burn off the excess fuel very similar to way the space shuttle does with the sparklers that catch any excess hydrogen around the bottom of the rocket. So hopefully future tests will be more successful. Now when is this going to launch? Uh, the word on the street from Elon Musk is any time between one month and 12 months. But I thought we were going to be seeing an orbital flight any day now. So we'll see how long that'll actually be. And of course, you're going to have to convert those times into musk years. I forget the math on that. It's like double and add 10. Anyway, so at some point in the next one month to 40 years, we should see super heavy starship go into orbital flight. NASA is gearing up for the space launch system. It's rough when the name of the rocket is like what it also does. So you say launch twice. All right, so a couple of weeks ago, we reported that NASA is planning to launch the space launch system launch 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 the SLS in the end of August, August 29th. And so far, they haven't changed from that date. And we're continuing to approach and they're making more and more preparations to meet that launch target. 
As we mentioned, they're going to launch the space launch system with the Orion capsule on top. The mission will go out to the moon, orbit around the moon for several weeks, and then return back and the capsule will land safely in the ocean. They've got a mannequin on board named Munikin Campos, which is named after an engineer that worked with NASA to help bring the Apollo 13 astronauts home. So it's sort of an interesting homage to them. Over the last couple of days, NASA has been holding day long teleconferences for journalists and other scientists involved in the project. And they've been going into a lot of detailed information, kind of too much to share. We saw some pretty cool technical documents about how the different Artemis missions are planned, all of the different stages and orbits and support spacecraft, how Artemis one and then Artemis two and then Artemis three, which hopefully is going to be the mission that brings humans back to the surface of the moon. NASA also mentioned that they're going to be opening up opportunities on the Artemis missions to all the current NASA astronauts. So we don't know the names who's going to be flying, but it could be anyone, veteran astronauts, new astronauts, everybody can have a chance to fly to the moon. And finally, we got a really cool animation of a plume under the space launch system. So this is a simulation of what the all of the fire is going to look like as it comes out the bottom of the SLS as it's taking off. You can sort of compare in your mind what it looked like with the Apollo missions and the space shuttle. Pretty cool. See how well it matches reality in a couple of weeks. Perseverance continues to find weird things on Mars. Now we've been reporting on new scientific discoveries by Perseverance, but we've also been reporting on all the weird stuff that it's been finding on Mars, mostly stuff that it brought with it. It found its parachute on the surface of Mars. It found its back shell, a lot of cables and wires associated with that. And a couple of weeks ago, we talked about this weird string object that drifted into the field of view and then the wind blew it away again. And so this week we saw a picture inside the drill chuck of the Perseverance rover. This is the machine that it uses to drill these core samples that it's storing up. It just finished its 12th core sample. And when you look inside, you can see this tiny little hair. It looks like a cat hair or like a little piece of dental floss. And I mean, that rover was cleaned within an inch of its life before it was sent to Mars. There's no way that anyone left a piece of string in there and they would have seen it in all the previous drills. So what is it? Where did it come from? Once again, it probably came from Perseverance itself. It's probably like a string left over from its parachute that somehow worked into the system or blew onto the rover and made its way into this. But NASA engineers are going to continue to analyze it. They're going to try and get the debris out of the drill truck so it doesn't actually infiltrate the samples that they're collecting. And hopefully this will be the last of the debris that Perseverance brought with it to Mars actually getting in the way of the science that it's doing. Celebrating 10 years for Curiosity on Mars. It feels like just yesterday that NASA's Curiosity rover landed on Mars, but it's been 10 years. The rover landed on Mars on August 5th, 2012. And I remember it very fondly. We actually did a live stream on my YouTube channel where we covered that and had special guests who were associated with the mission. And we talked about it and we had a lot of fun, but 10 years, that's amazing. Now over the course of this 10 years, Curiosity has really accomplished its main goal of searching for water or evidence of past water on Mars. And it's found many different examples that there was water acting on the surface of Mars for long periods of time. It's sampled dozens of rocks. It's crawled for many kilometers. It's slowly climbing up the flanks of Mount Sharp in Gale Crater on Mars. So what's next? Well, the next big goal for Curiosity is to move into this ancient flood channel called Geddes Vallis. And of course, there it's going to continue the search for ancient water on the surface of Mars. And it's still going strong. Now there's some damage to some of its wheels, but nothing that it can't deal with. It's power system is still delivering enough energy for it. All of its scientific instruments are working great. So it's likely we'll still see many more years of science coming from Curiosity. So we've got Perseverance, we've got Curiosity, and of course, we've got the Chinese rover. So we've got like three rovers right now working on the surface of Mars. We're living in the future. South Korea's first mission to the moon. A couple of weeks ago, we reported on South Korea's first orbital launch, their homegrown rocket 
system was able to carry a satellite payload into orbit. But they're also working on their own mission to the moon, which launched this week. It's called Denuri, which translates into enjoy the moon and it launched on a SpaceX Falcon 9 on a trajectory that's going to take it to the moon. Now, we don't know how it's going to turn out. But if it is successful, then South Korea will become the seventh country to send a spacecraft to the moon, which is pretty exciting. The spacecraft is going to go into orbit at about 100 kilometers above the moon, and it's going to be scanning the surface of the moon, it's going to be testing out different scientific instruments, and it's going to be trying to identify potential landing spots for future missions, both by South Korea and other countries. So stay tuned for that. A remote surgery robot is going to the International Space Station. And one of my question shows several months back, someone asked me like, how do astronauts deal with medical emergencies on board the International Space Station? Now they have a giant book, 1000 pages that gives detailed information on how to deal with every medical issue they could face. But for most situations, the answer is hop in a spacecraft and return to Earth so that doctors can deal with it. But that's not ideal. I mean, there's a lot of issues that astronauts want to be able to deal with on board the station without having to abort their entire mission. So NASA is planning to send a surgery robot to the International Space Station by 2024. And this robot will be able to create very small incisions, do surgery inside the body, do things like resection the bowel, which sounds like pretty big surgery, but apparently it's not. Now, this can be done remotely. So there can be doctors here on Earth that are going to be working the surgical robot on the space station. They've done several tests, they've done the surgical tests here on Earth. And also an astronaut has actually done surgery here on Earth, although the surgery was cutting through rubber bands and moving metal rings around to demonstrate the capability. But if all goes well, we should see this robot go to the space station in 2024, and then continue a bunch of those tests. And you can imagine again, some kind of future where if there's some kind of medical issue on board the station, doctors on Earth can use this robot remotely to be able to perform the surgery and keep the astronauts safe and healthy without them having to completely abandon their mission. And this will get even more important when you think about situations where say, they're going to be on the surface of Mars, and other astronauts are going to be in orbit, maybe you have a doctor who's in orbit around Mars that will be able to perform sur surgery on the astronauts that are down on the station when help is months, if not years away. Dwarf galaxies found without dark matter. Now we still don't know what dark matter is, but it is a puzzle. And the one possibility is that dark matter is some kind of particle that doesn't interact with regular matter except through gravity. And then the other possibility is that we just don't understand how gravity works at the largest scales. And often, we're finding evidence for the dark matter as a particle, but now we've got more evidence for the dark matter as a we don't understand gravity situation. And so what happened was astronomers were looking at dwarf galaxies that were located in a galaxy cluster that was about 62 million light years away. And these galaxies should be protected by a halo of dark matter that should be protecting it and allowing it to maintain a fairly dwarf galaxy shape. And what they found was that these galaxies have been distorted and mangled by the gravity in this galaxy cluster, and they're not being protected at all, which means that they probably don't have very much of a halo of dark matter around them at all. And yet this is completely the opposite to other evidence where astronomers have found galaxies that have a surprising amount of dark matter surrounding them, they're very well protected. So which is it? We don't know the mystery continues. Again, as always, stay tuned, more evidence needed. Hubble is still going strong. Now we've been sharing tons of pictures from the James Webb Space Telescope, but don't rule out the Hubble Space Telescope. It's still there, it's still working hard, it's oversubscribed. And we got just an amazing picture of one of my favorite types of objects, a globular star cluster. This is NGC 6638. It's a globular star cluster that it's located in the Sagittarius region of the Milky Way sort of near the core of the Milky Way, there's a lot of globular star clusters in that area. And what's amazing about globular star clusters is that they're just these relics, they seem to be as old as the galaxy itself, almost as old as the universe itself. And yet they hold together in this sort of buzzing ball 
of stars where the average distance between the stars is about one light year across. And I always imagine like, what would it be like to stand on a planet in one of the stars where all of the stars around you are packed that closely together, it would be quite inspiring. Where we are in the Milky Way, stars are only about four light years apart or even more. And so it would just be a totally different experience to see the night sky. But Hubble can get us most of the way there. So enjoy this picture. Now, if you want more information on the stories that I'm talking about, you should definitely check out our website, Universe Today, but also sign up to my weekly email newsletter. I write this every Friday. It goes out to over 50,000 people. There's no advertisements in it. I write every word totally free. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter. And if you want an audio version of all of the videos that we do at Universe Today, just go to universetoday.com slash podcast, or just search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you to everyone who supports us and helps keep us independent on Patreon. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Andrew M. Gross, who supports us at the master of the universe level. Your support means the universe to us. All right, that's all the stories for this week. I'll see you next week. One sneak preview. Uh, I've got a very special interview coming up on August 22nd. Even though I'm in hiatus, I'm coming back to do one special interview. I'm not going to tell you who it is yet, but these images should give you a hint. All right, we'll see you next week.